dāmas un kungi, dārgie konferences dalībnieki, mūsu tiešraidas vērotāji. Mans vārds ir Artis Ozoliņš, un es sveicu jūs atpakaļ starptautiskajā zinātniskajā konferencē personību, kultūru un valodu krustcelēs. Pētrim Šmitam 150. A reminder, this conference is also available in translation in English uh, in your audio devices that are available by the entrance. Konference ir klausām arī tulkojumā Latviešu valodā audio ierīcēs, kas ir pieejama pie ieejas. Aizvadījām diezgan interesantu un bagātīgu pirmo bloku, uzzinot, kād, kāds tad ir bijis vēsturiskais laikmets, kurā Pēteris Šmits ir dzīvojis un strādājis. Laiks pievērsties Pēteris Šmita ieguldījumam sinoloģijas studijās. Un pirmās divas prezentācijas šajā blokā mums ir no īpašiem ārvalstu viestiem no tālās Ķīnas. Pirmkārt vēlos aicināt šeit priekšā Liu Wei, Pekins ārzemju studiju universitātes profesori, kura pasniegs stāstību mācību grāmatu, kas pavēr jaunas iespējas ķīniešu valodas apgūvē Krievijā. Pēteris Šmita mēģinājums radīt mandarīnu gramatikas vingrinājums. Sagaidām ar siltiem aplausiem. Hello everyone. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to come to the University of Riga in Latvia and communicate with all of you about my doctoral research topic, Latvian Russian sinologist Peter Schmidt and his Chinese grammar uh, with texts for exercises. Uh, this book is not only opened a new era of Russian Chinese teaching at that time, and even 100 years later, it is also regarded as a significant pioneering work in the history of world Chinese teaching and research. Mm. Started with a brief look at the book's author, uh, we divided his life into three stages, before, during, and uh, uh, after along the lines of the Oriental Institute in Vladivostok. Uh, he is a famous Latvian Russian or or Orientalist and especially good at the study of uh, Manchuria and uh, Sinology. His work are regarded as the foundation of the new academic practice school of Sinology in Russia. So in 1902, Schmidt received a master's degree in Chinese and Manchu liter literature and a professorship as the author of the textbook. This book embodies the essence of his Chinese learning, teaching, and research. So how is this book written? Re written. Let us briefly introduce the background of the book. Okay, it was born in the following ways. First, the urban development of Vladivostok. Second, the establishment of Oriental, Oriental Institute. And the third one is Schmidt's own academic background. Fourth, the self-development of language discipline. And the fifth, the accumulation of Western Chinese studies. Since Haishenwai was renamed Vladivostok, it has bec become an important military base for Russia in the Far East. Then the large railway connected the central part with the Far East, brought huge benefits to Russia in political, economic, military, cultural, and other fields. Under the tide of the development in the Far East, there is a growing need for Oriental language talents. After the establishment of the uh, Oriental Institute, uh, it is uh, rapidly developed into Russia's first center of Chinese studies in the Far East. The aim of the school is to train Far East practical talents for Russia and to communicate um, um, to, uh, for Russia and to cooperate with government's po policies and activities of the Far East. So, uh, this is the aims of the Oriental Institute. Mm. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, there are some pictures uh, uh, for Oriental Institute. And the third reason, the academic background of the sinologist. Uh, 
In such a context, it is necessary for experts in Oriental languages to lead the teaching team of the new college. Schmidt was among the top choices. We are going on to the third reason. Um, the, thir the author's own academic background. His, uh, as we can say, his school record was excellent. This is a fundamental reason for finishing the book. And this is, uh, 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 this is what in uh, Central History called Arch Archives of St. Petersburg. So the four, fourth reason is the uh, new stage of linguistic development. Much of the discussion and the framework in this book is related to linguistic theories. And it can be seen that linguistic really greatly influenced Schmidt's writing. At the turn of the 19th and 20th century, it should be such a period. Uh, comparative historical li linguistics tends to mature and the general linguistics form a uh, systems, and uh, modern linguistics is budding. His study of Chinese is also influenced by these trends. In this book, there are many ideas of several major linguistic schools of the 19th century, such as Yang Grammar School, the Russian Kazan School, and the Moscow School of Languages. And of course, from the perspective of Chinese research, the author can only write this book after fully boring the achievements of predecessors. In the book, a large number of Western and Chinese writers are quoted. As his arguments and materials, he is very good at summing up. Here are some of the works. Uh, so, um, my title is a test book that opens a modern window of Russian Chinese teaching. Why do we say so? What was Russian Chinese teaching before it? In what ways did it usher in a new era? That's what I wanted to focus on today. Um, I want to analyze the characteristics of this test book from the following aspects. Third, First, the style of the textbook, and uh, second, uh, the context, and the third one is concept. The center of Russian sinology in the 19th century was the St. Petersburg University, and one of the most famous Chinese textbooks was a book named uh, Chinese Grammar by Bichulin. It has been used for a half a century, most of which uh, is uh, explanations of uh, vocabulary, but the discussion of grammar itself is very little, uh, which gradually fails to meet the new learning requirements. Let's go back to Schmidt. Um, the book is divided into two parts, an introduction and a handout. In the preface, he emphasized that the language lecture is used for study, while the instruction of linguistics should be mainly used for reading uh, and study. The, in the instruction, there are 13 chapters, each of, which, each of which is a theme, such as the status of Chinese in the world languages, dialects, um, uh, pre-consonants uh, pre and post-consonants, vowels and their phonetic changes, the formation and the Mandarin, root, tongue, stress, Chinese characters, radicals, dictionary styles, phonetic notion, notation, and so on. And there are uh, 64 lessons in the handout section, and each lecture has a distinct grammatical theme. It covers almost all parts of speech and sentence patterns in oral Beijing Mandarin. Each class has have five sections, grammar point explanation, word explanations, sentence spelling, translation exercises, and annotation. Um, I, and I will also analyze uh, Schmidt's achievements in the study of Chinese grammar from the perspective of theory and practice. I choose a small example for both. And this is uh, Predislove. Okay, first, in, term of, in terms of grammar, 
theory. The book is filled with linguistics ideas almost everywhere. It was influenced by the major grammar schools at that time. I chose two representative points of the young grammar school mentioned above to uh, illustrate how Schmidt applies them. The first will is starting Starting uh, the living modern language and dialects in the preface, he has emphasized the importance of living uh, uh, the, of live language in analyze. The author lists such tables, such tables, uh, compares the official languages, major dialects, and the languages of Indo-Chinese people, and concludes their connections and chains. And then I chose the second point. And then I chose the second. Ah, a second um, is in terms of. Uh, um, I choose the second point is uh, contrast and uh, analogy of language laws, as you can see. Each group of words is related to the pronunciation and the meaning of the root. And the author uh, analogi uh, analogizes the law of, uh, of der derivation of words in Chinese to reach similar conclusions. Okay, and uh, the second one. Second one is in terms of grammar practice. He is good at summarizing previous achievements and bringing forth new ideas. Let's look at, look at an example. Here, Schmidt summed up the basic use of known, known uh, very well. Even now, it seems very logical. Schmidt had a strong awareness of word uh, uh, collocation and made a straight distinction between known and the collocation of nouns, of nouns, adjectives, of nouns, adjectives, and action verbs, and summarized a relatively complete set of known use methods in uh, in the after class translation. Uh, some examples from the textbook of their uh, of others, uh, sinologist was selected. And as we can see, in these popular Chinese textbooks, we cannot find such complete and clear grammatical explanations in their books as Schmidt's, right? Uh, their textbooks are still at the stage of uh, listing sentences and the text one by one, with almost no specific grammatical rules. From this, we can see that Schmidt's grammar books really achieve the purpose of using scientific linguistic knowledge to analyze and study grammar and express, express grammatical phenomena. The concept of the test book is studying language from the perspective of structuralism within language. It is a concept of general linguistics. So um, finally, here are some typical comments to evaluate the book. The first is from um, the, the first is from the linguistic Dictionary of Soviet Sinology. The second, uh, we can see in Schmidt's Mandarin Grammar Test, it is prop proposed for the first time that there are word classes in chi Chinese. And the second is from a famous sinologist in the 20th century, the author of A History of Russian Sinology. And he said, uh, Skachkov, he said, uh, his Chinese grammar book published in 1902, which studies Chinese from a linguistic perspective, has an epoch-making significance in the field of sinology in Russia. So, and uh, the third one is pure, um, the third one is from contemporary Russian sinologist who wrote a Schmidt's bi uh, biographies. And he said the importance and the reality of his views on the uh, diver diversity of spoken uh, Chinese from an uh, academic point of view, which he narrated and summarized in this book. 
on the um, it is not only on the position of Chinese uh, and uh, and uh, but it it has also developed the concept of the Indo-Chinese language family. And this is my evaluation. Uh, this book is a primary textbook for Chinese Mandarin learners in the Oriental Institute. From the perspective of the theory and practice, it presents the basic features of Beijing Mandarin in the late 19th century. The author tried to use historical comparative linguistics to compare the relations and differences between Chinese internal dialects and other languages in uh, uh, phonetics, grammar, and vocabulary so as to reposition Chinese coordinates in the world languages. It has successfully applied the ideas and the methods of general linguistics to analyze and conclude various grammatical phenomena in the oral Mandarin. At the same time, Schmidt was also good at summarizing and concluding on the basic basis of Chinese grammar study by previous scholars, uh, removing the rough and save the essence and bringing forth uh, the fresh. And all in all, Schmidt has ushered in a new era in the history of sinology in Russia at that time, and Chinese teaching in the world, both in terms of its style, contact, and the concept. Thank you very much. Paldies Lūvēji par šo unikālo skatījumu, starptautisko skatījumu uz Pēteru Šmīta darbu. Turpināsim ar mūsu pašu Latvijas universitātes Konfūciju institūta ķīnas puses direktora Sheng Kuan Yu un Pekinas ārzemes studiju universitātes studentus un Latvijas universitātes doktorants Liu Jan stāstījumu Latviešu sinologa Pēteru Šmīta pētījumu par ķīnu. Pašreizējā situācija un nozīme. Sagaidām ar aplausiem. Good afternoon, uh, co uh, colleagues. Uh, first, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to stand here to present our recent uh, study. And uh, it is really open a new door to me. And uh, my name is Lu Yan, and now I'm a, a PhD student in University of uh, Latvia. And uh, today, our topic is about uh, uh, Professor Schmitz from Chinese perspective. So his contribution and the current research status in China. And uh, the presentation will be presented uh, by me and my colleague, Professor uh, Shang. And uh, so I will uh, first uh, introduce the background of our study and uh, uh, the, uh, the contributions uh, of uh, Professor Schmitz from our perspective. And uh, so this year, we celebrate, uh, celebrate here together uh, about the uh, um, 115th anniversary of the birth of uh, Professor Schmitz. And uh, UNESCO Latvia lists the anniversary in the calendar of celebration in the um, academic year. So we can see the significance of uh, Professor Schmitz. But, uh, we, uh, com commemorate uh, him not only because he is a folklorist, not only because he is a linguistic, but uh, also a sinologue. But in another side, so sinologues uh, um, related to China. So in China, what we know about him, and uh, uh, so this research, uh, uh, this con uh, this conference urged us to do this kind of research to see what happened in China. And uh, fortunately, actually in China now, information about uh, uh, Professor Schmitz is still a big unknown. Take myself, for example. Before this study, actually, 
I know that uh, uh, the history of uh, synology in, in Latvia, actually, it is quite long. And, but uh, about the first generation of the synologues, actually, I knew nothing uh, before this research. So why I said that uh, this uh, conference actually opens a new door to me. And uh, we can also see that our colleague uh, Luo Wei, actually, uh, he and uh, she and his uh, uh, she and her supervisor uh, are the first persons who are uh, doing research on Professor Schmitz. And so, in this situation, two questions emerge. And uh, the first one, as a synologist, what uh, contribution did uh, Professor Schmitz achieve? So what is the significance of uh, Professor? And the second one, what is the current status of research on Professor Schmitz in China's academia? And I will introduce the first question, and my colleague will uh, introduce the second. And we use the research method document analysis. So we uh, find about 10 research papers in Chinese database. And uh, we also read the materials uh, uh, from Latvian side about the historical and the statistics uh, information about the University of Latvia and its uh, faculties. And the list of uh, books, uh, collections of uh, Professor Schmitz and other publications and the manuscripts about uh, uh, Professor Schmitz. And uh, uh, after the document analysis, uh, we can see that the contribution of uh, um, Professor Schmitz is really very big, uh, very big and very great. And if we just use one sentence to summarize, he is the forefather of Sinology in Latvia. And I will explain the forefather in the following four aspects. The first aspect is uh, the aspect of linguistics. So uh, Professor Schmitz not only point, uh, pointed out the uni uh, uniqueness of uh, Mandarin in terms of uh, its uh, phonetics, grammar, and so on, but also point, uh, pointed out the relationship between Mandarin and uh, other or oriental languages. And he also made the comparison, uh, comparison of uh, Peking uh, dialect with the dialects in the neighboring regions. This give, uh, gives us uh, an overview of the phonetic mapping in the area of the late Qing dynasty. And uh, his book, Attempt of Mandarin Grammar, is the first uh, scientific work to address Chinese phonetic questions in Europe. So it's really a very great um, contribution. And uh, the second point, Professor Schmitz investigated almost all the Tukun's Manchu tribes and their languages or dialects. He is the first scholar to classify the language group. And the second aspect is about uh, language teaching. And uh, Professor Schmitz not only taught uh, um, uh, Mandarin, uh, Mongolian, and uh, Manchu in uh, Russia and uh, Latvia, but uh, he also taught the Russian language in China, so we can see there are two parts. And about uh, his contribution in language teaching, uh, first, he developed and uh, collected a lot of uh, uh, important teaching materials. And uh, the most significant one is uh, uh, the one which uh, uh, our colleague uh, just now introduced, attempt of Mandarin grammar. And uh, it is effectively put an end to the domination of Chinese language in enlightenment by uh, Pichuling and uh, rushed it into a new period. And uh, the second aspect is uh, about the teaching methodology. Because in the oriental uh, institution, we can see that uh, the teaching uh, of uh, Chinese language there actually uh, um, paid a lot of in, uh, attention to the programma programma uh, pragmatic competence of students. 
And uh, here we also, it is worth it to uh, point out that uh, uh, Professor Schmitz also did a great uh, contribution during the establish of uh, the first uh, Chinese uh, university and uh, in the uh, Russian language teaching in China. And uh, the third aspect is about the Chinese, uh, China studies. Um, Professor Schmidt's attention not just uh, only paid to the uh, classic um, uh, f uh, uh, philology, but also to the chi uh, China studies. Uh, he did studies in the Oriental uh, Institute and uh, gave the lectures uh, about uh, the regional studies and the national studies in the aspect of uh, economy, political system and the foreign policy and the uh, international situation. So this curriculum uh, during that time offered study disciplines in regional studies and it was unique in university in Russia. And uh, the fourth aspect is about uh, his uh, book collection. So the collection of Professor B uh, Schmitz includes books and manuscripts in Chinese, Manchu, Mongolia, and other ethnic uh, languages. And uh, the most uh, remarkable part is uh, 34 uh, xylographic zel works and the manuscripts in Chinese, Manchu, and uh, Mongolia. And uh, they were published in very limited number during that time. So many of them maybe just have one copy and now in University of Latvia. And so this is uh, the contribute from our aspects. And uh, here I also um, would like to do a brief introduction to myself. I'm not only a PhD student in university, but I'm also um, working in Beijing Foreign Studies University, and uh, we now we have the uh, language program of Latvia. So uh, we, our interest is to introduce China to Latvia and uh, to introduce Latvia to China. So if um, you have the same interest, so maybe we can have some uh, um, talk and uh, discussion. And uh, now we welcome our, uh, our colleague, yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Chinese director of uh, Confucius Institute at University of Latvia. Our office on the second floor, so welcome you to visit. Uh, my colleague, uh, Peter uh, Pitkovich here, uh, he's a Latvian director of Confucius Institute, and he's the recognition of uh, Peter Schmidt. Uh, I have to say, you know, these days I have been coughing very seriously. Uh, I hope, for, I hope uh, it won't interrupt, interrupt uh, my presentation. That's why so my presentation is very concise, very simple and short. <coughs> now let's move on um, to the res uh, second research uh, question about your uh, contribution. Uh, where? Sorry. Why not? Oh, sorry. Um, the second research question is about uh, current research status in China. According to our document analysis, so far only a dozen publications in China deal partially or specifically on Professor uh, Peter Schmidt and his works, including 10 journal articles and two books. In terms of content, these 12 publications can be divided into three types. The first type, an introduction of uh, Professor Peter Schmidt and or his works. Of the 1,000 existing publications in China, seven of them introduced Professor Schmidt to Chinese readers, either very briefly or with some details. Some introductory accounts of Peter uh, Schmidt are all made as a part of the survey of the historical development of uh, Manchology, Sinology, or the teaching of Manchurian or Mandarin in Russia or in Latvia. In these accounts, Professor Peter Schmitz is introduced 
as one, uh, but one of many members in the related academics community. Sketchy introductions gave just a few lines on Professor uh, Patrice Schmidt's education background and career. Uh, lengthy accounts include some details, but close reading finds even some details to be inaccurate. The second type, translation of Professor Patrice Schmidt's works. Of the large number of uh, publications made by Professor Perry Schmidt himself, so far two journal articles and one book have been translated into Chinese. The two articles include the language of Nijidaos and the language of Origins. Both of the papers, uh, articles are published in Latvia uh, in 1920s and were translated into Chinese in 21st century. Uh, the book is an attempt of uh, Mandarin grammar with the texts for exercises. It was uh, translated by Miss Lowy here and her supervisor. They finished translating last year and it will be come out someday, maybe this year or next year in China. Um, the third type, academic research on Professor uh, Pedro Schmidt. The past two years witnessed the beginning of the genuine efforts to make more focused research on Professor Pedro Schmidt. That means in the sense of academic analysis, including two conference papers. One entitled A Phonetic Synchronic Comparison of Beijing Mandarin and the Surrounding Languages Dialects in Schmidt's book. The second entitled, A Textbook That Opens the Modern Window of Chinese Teaching in Russia, also about uh, Professor's book. Uh, both conference papers are written by uh, Luo Wei. Now, let's move on to a conclusion and uh, recommendation. In terms of conclusion, we have two points. First, as a forefather of Sinology in Latvia, Professor Peter Schmidt made great contributions in the fields of linguistics, language teaching, China studies, and book collection, etc. So it is of great significance to the research on Professor Perry Schmidt. Number two, Professor Perry Schmidt's research in China so far does not match the great, uh, his great contributions and also does not reveal the great significance of research on Professor. Compared with the study of Professor Petrus Schmidt in Europe, especially in Latvia, research is related to or on Professor Petrus Schmidt in China, far lag behind, both in quantity and quality. Like, the existing publications are small in number, and most offer only background information, sometimes inaccurate about Professor Bielogowicz Smith and his versatile activities and colorful career. In terms of uh, recommendation, we also have two points. First, while celebrating the 150th anniversary of the birth of Professor Perry Smith today, we feel strongly the importance and impendency to raise awareness of Perry Smith among Chinese scholars and a call for more comprehensive and in-depth study on the study uh, on the life and the works of this great scholar. Second, we are looking forward to publishing a collection of uh, today's and tomorrow's conference articles by University of Latvia Press. And also, we would like to translate it in Chinese and uh, get it published in China. So the Chinese people, especially the scholars, know more about uh, Professor uh, Schmidt. Um, yeah, this is a reference. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much, Boris. Lielis paldies gan Shenkonyu, gan Luyan par šo unikālo skatījumu uz Pēteru Šmita devumu. Un tagad turpināsim tālāk ar Leona Taivānu, Latvijas Universitātes Humanitāra Zinājuma fakultātes profesora stāstījumu par Pēteru Šmitu un Ķīnas reālijām 19. 20. gadsimta mijā. Sagaidām ar aplausiem. Want 
to pełne darbo jest. Nie, nie, nie. Ale jak woda, te kolejdzie, ja wiesz, pierwszą kartą, ja wiesz, gdyby wysteigt sierstlink pateicība mārītē savičē par ļoti labu organizēto konferenci un par ļoti lietišķējiem un labiem atgādinājumiem, mužīgi, aizmāršīgiem profesoriem, kādu un ko jādara. Liels paldies jums. Un jāsaka tā, ka pēc profesoru Jākapsonu un pāri jau vēsturnieku teikt, tā ir diezgan maz atlicis, ko teikt. Vēl jau vairāk pēc tam, kad ir izteikti konkrēti un pamatīgi spriedumi par profesoru Pēteru Šmita devumu. Tur man tikai atliek tas mazums, kā varbūt savilpt kaut kādus galvas kopā un vēlreiz pateikt to, par ko profesors Šans teic, it's you, profesors Šans par to background information, par to fona informāciju, un mans, tā teikt, ziņojums arī zina vairāk par fona informāciju. Es gribētu turies, tad te jau bija minēts, atgādināt vēl vienu tādu lietu, kā Pētera Šmita darbība un sekojošā tai. Latvijas universitāte īstenotā Sinoloģija tomēr ir un paliek lielākas kopības vai lielākas tradīcijas, un tā ir Krievs sinoloģijas turpinājums. Protams, mums ir sinologi šodien, kas darbojās, kas ir studējuši Eiropas valstīs, bet tomēr šī skola ir turpinājums, un šī skolas pamatlicējas ir mūks jakinums, ko sauca viņa pirmajā vārdā Nikita Bičūrins, kurš saskaņā ar Kjahtas līgumu, kas tika noslēgts 1727. gadā, strādāja Pekīnā, vadot devīto garīgo misiju. Es gribētu pasvītrot šeit šo garīgās misijas nosaukumu, jo Krievija, un mēs redzēsim arī tālāk, kad citas rietuma imperialistiskās valstis īstenoja, tā teikt, Ķīnas garīgu vai intelektuālu pārorientāciju, kas nebija vienkārši un nebija viennozīmīga lieta. Jebkurā gadījumā tātad Bičūrins ir ielicis lielu un svarīgu pamatu, tai ziņā ka viņš ir izveidojis pirmo Krievu valodā, jeb Krievu auditorijai paredzēt ķīniešu mācību grāmatu. Viņš ir izveidojis ķīniešu zilbju transliterāciju, pirmo transliterāciju Krievu valodas lietošanai, kur pamatā pastāv aiz vēl šodien. Un Bičūrins bija ļoti talantīgs etnologs, viņš bija talantīgs vēsturnieks, tulkotājs, un ar to viņš iedibina ķīnas izspēti kā tādu starp disciplināru nozari, kurai sekos vēlāk Pēteris Šmits. Un te mēs redzam, nu, bija jau šis slaids, tātad Bičūrini ķīniešu gramatiku, kas faktiski kalpoja vairāk par pusgadu simtien, kādu 70 gadu, tā bija pamata mācību grāmata. Atnāk Mičūrins, atnāk Šmits, un Šmits Čīnā pastrādāja tikai trīs gadus. Studējis, kā jau bija teiks, viņš bija Pēterburgā, un viņa ekskluzīvās zināšanas un talants deva viņiem iespēju un izveidot nākamās paudzes Krievu valodai, Krievu valodā rakstīto ķīniešu mācību grāmatu, par ko tāpat bija teikts. Bet tieši bija Bičūrina mantojums Šmitam ielika, jo tā var teikt, viņa zinātnieka šūpulī, 
ielika arī zina interesi par etnoloģiju, par vēsturi un par citām humanitārajām nozarēm, kas ļāva šmitam vēlāk pārslēgties pilnībā un ļoti talantīgi un veiksmīgi uz latviešu valvodas folklors pētījumiem. Tagad nedaudz par to fona situāciju. Gadu gadu 19.–20. gadu 100. mījā Ķīna atradās imperialistisko valstu ielenkumu stāvoklī. Ķīna nekad nu līdzīgi kā sijam, nekad nebija tieši kolonija, tāda kā kāda bija Indija, piemēram, bet Ķīnas bagātības vilināja imperialistiskās lielvalstis un Eiropas un arī Japānas tātad valdošās aprindas bija ļoti ieinteresētas Ķīnu izmantot un varbūt pat pavērdzināt savās interesēs. Šeit mēs redzam savā laiku karikatūru, kur mēs varam sazīmēt dažas pazīstamas figūras, piemēram, Nikolaju Otro un Anglijas karalienu un Francijas republikas attēlu šeit. Bet reālajā dzīvē šo valstu dalīšanu, šī Ķīnas dalīšana norisinājās ļoti intensīvi, tika veidotas ekonomiskās zonas, tika atrautas konkrētas teritorijas, Un Krievijai šeit bija zināma un ļoti nopietna loma, jo Krievija tātad interesējās par ziemeļu Maņžūri un būvēja, kā jau tas bija minēts, tātad šeit dzelzceļa. Nu, protams, kad arī citas valstis, tad būtu jāpiemina to, ka Šimono Seki līgums ar Japānu spiedu Ķīnu nodot spēcīgai kaimiņa valstī Japānai, tātad suverenitāti par Koreju, atdot Taivānas salu, Penghu salu grupu, Ļaudans pussalu un tā tālāk. Bet tas viss zīmē to ļoti nelāgo situāciju, kāda pastāvēja Ķīnā tajā brīdī, kad Šmits tajā ieradās kā Krievijas impērijas pārstāvs. Ķīna tikko bija pārdzīvojusi pārdzīvojusi ļoti postošo un nelāgo nelāgo taipinu sacelšanos. Un šī taipinu sacelšanās tikko bija beigusies un Ķīnā sākās jaunas iekšējas problēmas, kuras man te pazūda attēlus varat piepalīdzēt, kas tev atbildīgs par. Kaut kas ir uz jau parādījās. Tātad runāju par to, ka Ķīnas paldies, paldies, ka Ķīnas tauta šo un liela daļa Ķīnas intelektuāļa, tradicionālo intelektuāļa, uztvēra šo rietumu ielaušanos Ķīnas teritorijā kā tādu, kā vienu no daudziem, no daudzām vēsturiskām epizodēm, un ka Ķīna tiks ārā no šīs situācijas. Un, kad nav, bet, un šo šīs, šis tā kā attēls mums rāda, nu, tādu attēlu no šīs tradicionālās Ķīnas kultūras, kur mēs redzam, kur jauniešiem liek zemoties senču altāra priekšā. Turpat mēs redzam aizmugurē cilvēku, kas smēķē ōpiju, un tas ir mantojums no ōpiju kariem, kas ir norisinājušies šajā gadsimtā nebez Eiropas nejaukās līdzdalības. Tas ir attēls tradicionālai Ķīnai, tradicionālās Ķīnas domāšanai. Šī tradicionālās Ķīnas intelektuālie pārstāvi 
klusībā kūdīja jaunu sacelšanos. Un tā ir tādā vietā ihetoņa sacelšanās, jeb tādā vietā boksera sacelšanās, kas bija slepena reliģiska biedrība. No sākuma tā bija vērsta pret Manžūru dinastiju, bet mēs pamazām tā sāk vērsties pret eiropiešiem. Un, lūk, šeit šī intelektuāla elita, šie garīdznieki, šie misionāri, kas darbojās Ķīnā, Viņi bija tie, kas izraisīja vienā lielā Ķīnas iedzīvotāja daļā nepieņemšanu, nepatiku, ienaidu. Un viņi bija lielā mērā šīs bokseri, jeb ihetroņas atcelšanās ierosinātāji. Šmits atradās, diemžēl, šo eiropeizētāju skaitā. Kaut arī jāsaka tā, ka paši akadēmiķi savulaik rakstot par šo situāciju atzīmē, ka Krievijas intelektuālā elita, kas tajā lūk, tajā intelektuālajā procesā, tātad ienesot Eiropas vērtības Ķīnā, paši nepiedalījās imperialistiskajā politikā un neatbalstīja valdības pārstāvis. Šeit mēs redzam ihietoņu sacelšanās dalībnieku signalizētāju un vēl viena fotogrāfija no sacelšanās dalībnieku attēli, kurus ir nofotografējis nezināmas Japāņa fotogrāfas 1900. gadā. Atzīmēsim to, ka Pēter Šmits tajā brīdī jau Pekinā nebija, bet 1900. gada jūnijā boksera sacelšanās dalībnieki ielaužās Pekinas pilsētā, un Un tā nebija vienīgā vieta. Mēs redzam šeit, šajā kartē, tātad vairākus visu to reģionu, kurā šie ihetoņa sacelšanās notika. Rietuma valsts, kurām Ķīnā bija milzīgas ekonomiskās intereses un politiskās intereses, tū daļu saformēja deviņu nāciju kontingentu, kuram bija uzdots apspiest, apspiest šos ikietojuņu sacelšanās, sacelšanās Pekīnā un citās Ķīnas vietās. Izrēķināšanās ar ikietojuņu sacelšanās dalībniekiem bija gaužām nežēlīgi, un šeit mēs jau redzam regulārās varas, tātad nāves spriedumu izpildes šajā ļoti dramatiskajā situācijā. Arī Krievi, diemžēl, un mums šeit man bija to interesanti dzirdēt, tātad iespējams, kad arī latvieši karotāji piedalījās ikietoņu sacelšanās apspiešanā. Krievi artilērijas vienība šeit iestormē Pekīnas pilsētas vārtas 1900. gada 14. augusta naktī, 13. dienu iepriekš bija sākušies nemieri, kuros šī sacelšanās dalībnieki galvenokārt grāva ne tikai ārzemi vēstniecību kvartēles, bet reliģiskās iestādes un kultūras iestādes. Jo Ķīnā bija apmēram pūz otrs miljons kristiešu uz to brīdi, cilvēki, kas bija pieņēmuši kristietību, un sevi saistīja lielā mērā ar Eiropas kultūras vērtībām, ar modernizāciju. Viņi arī bija ļoti lielā mērā iesaistīt tā laika Ķīnas modernizācijas procesā, dabīgi esot izglītoti pēc Eiropas kategorijām, un tātad varoši strādāt Eiropas firmās un uzņēmumos. Šajā ļoti dramatiskajā situācijā parādās ķīniešu pašu ļoti interesants figūras, no kurām vajadzētu nosaukt vispirms jau Kanju Vei, kurš ierosina lielākas reformas, kuras tiek īstenots simts dienu laikā līdz valsts apvērsumam, kuru kurš notiek šī 103 dienu perioda beigās, un viens no viņa ierosinājumiem ir dibināt Pekīnas universitāti. Pēc šī ļoti ievērojumā Ķīnas intelektuāļa ierosinājuma Pekīnas universitāti tiek dibināt, un tās 
tas notiek 1898. gada 9. augustā. Un tās pirmais, tā teikt, titulārais rektors ir misionārs Viljams Aleksandrs Parsons Martins, kurš kurš ir nācis, kas būtu interesanti, mums no Livonijas, Indijāna. Noceļojot pie Indijāna, es sastapu nemaz latviešus arī šodien, varbūt, kad Viljams Martins bija kaut kādā veidā saistīts arī zin ar pirmajiem pārceļotājiem tūru. Patiesībā sakot, īsto Pekinas universitātes darbību vadīja suņi dzeņai, kas bija ievērojams savā laika valsts ierēdnes, bet Viljams Martins bija priekšnieks Pēterim Šmitam, jo viņš reāli vadīja rietumu izglītības departamentu, un Pekinas universitātē Pēterim Šmitam bija uzdots mācīt Krievu valodu. Un šī Krievu valodas mācīšana tad ar notika šī Martina pāraudzībā un vadībā. Ir mūsu literatūrā šur un tur parādījušās ziņas par to, ka Pēteris Šmits ir bijis Pekinas universitātes beidā, universitātes dibinātāju skaitā. Man tomēr tādas ziņas apliecināt neizdevās dokumentos un jādomā, ka tas tā tomēr nebūs bijis, jo viņš bija toreiz jauns faktiski cilvēks, nu var teikt iesācējis savā docētāja darbā un diezin vai viņš tāds varēja būt. Kaut arī no otras puses universitātes dibināšana bija lielā mērā rietumnieku, nebez rietumnieku līdzdalības, un varbūt, ka viņš kaut kādā komisijā tur varēja būt bijis. Nu, tātad, jebkurā gadījumā, tātad viņa agrīnie darbības soļa Pekinā ir bijuši saistīt ar šo universitāti. Viņu ikietoņa sacelšanās gaitā slēdza, slēdza uz pusotru diviem gadiem, pēc tam viņa atjaunoja savu darbību, un vēlākos gados jau Pekinas universitāte darbojās ļoti prominentas personas, tie bija Čeng Jusju, Lida Džau, Mao Cedun, Hu Shi, ievērojamais filozofs, Un visas šīs figūras kaut kādā veidā, nu, netieši, ir saistīts arī ar Pēteru Šmitu tajā ziņā, ka viņš lūk tātad bija dalīgs tajā Ķīnas, ja tā var teikt, vesternizācijas un modernizācijas procesā. Nu, tagad, protams, jautājums ir vēl par viņa darbības izvērtējumu. Ja šeit ar Šmita personību nodarbotos Edvards Saits, ievērojamais orientālismu teorijas un kritikas pamatlicējus, tad viņš teiktu, ka Pēteris Šmits bija nekas cits kā imperiālisma ideologs, kurš palīdzēja īstenot Krievijas impērijas mantiskās un ideoloģiskās interesas Ķīnā. Nu, lai rehabilitētu Pētera Šmita, es tomēr gribētu teikt cits vārdus. Atcerēsimies to, ka pēc valsts apvērsuma 1917. gadā Krievijā, Krievija atsakās no imperialistiskās politikas un atsakās arī no kapitālistiskā ceļa, kuru bija īstenojis Krievijas impērija Un Krievija ir tā, kas lielā mērā Ķīnai ir palīdzējusi tās pirmajos modernizācijas gadu desmitos, palīdzot gan politiski, gan ekonomiski. Ķīna sekoja Krievijas modelīm, ja padomu savienības modelīm, attīstības modelīm. Krievu valoda bija pirmā svešvaloda Ķīnā, un tādēļ jāda Pēteris Šmits, Sākot Krievu valodas pasniegšanu Ķīnā, ir bijis šī procesa aizsācējs, kurš, esmu dzīvi pārliecināts, ir novedis Ķīnu līdz mūsdienu modernajai 
ievērību gūvušajiem valstiskumam. Paldies par uzmanību, un beidzot šos vārdus, es gribētu teikt, ka mūsu rindās sēž Pēteris Pildegovičs, kurš tāpat, kā Pēteris Šmits, ir strādājis ilgus gadus Vladivostokā, ir tāpat, kā Pēteris Šmits vadīja, viņš vadīja tur tālu Austrumu universitātē Austrumu studijas, arī Pēteris Pildegovičs ir turpinājis šīs studijas, un es gribētu teikt, ka tā līnija, Tā līnija, kuru aizsāka Bičūrins, turpināja Pēteris Šmits, turpinās šeit Latvijā Pēteris Pildegovičs personālie lamērā, un viņa studenti ir veiksmīgi ķīniešu valodas eksperti dažādās valsts un nevalstiskās institūcijās. Paldies par uzmanību! Paldies Taivānu kungam! Man šeit, ka ir laiks, nedaudz pamosties, tāpēc aicinu jūs visus iedzert siltu tās kafijas šeit par blakus telpā lielajai aulai un atgriežamies šeit pulksteni 3.30.